I finally watched The Bad Guys, which is a recently released, well, okay, not that recent anymore, but I think it still counts. Anyway, it's a recently released animated heist comedy from DreamWorks, and it's got strong Ocean's 12 vibes. And the animation and visual treatment reminded me a lot of Into the Spider-Verse, which apparently, after further research, was a very big influence. Possible spoilers ahead, so beware if you haven't seen it yet. This is another of those 3D animated films that are actually kind of a hybrid between 2D and 3D because it's got a very strong 2D visual treatment and a lot of 2D elements added to it. The look and feel of the graphics and animation is very illustrative and stylized, while still having a sense of 3D volume and that physical light of a 3D world. The complexities of the 3D world have been simplified and pared down to leave us with basic shapes and minimal visual information, like in the texturing, which further supports that 2D treatment. For instance, while they have fur, it's not fur with all those strand details, and the textures have these painterly strokes and areas of roughness and texture that make it feel more like a hand-illustrated 2D animation, even though it's 3D. There are parts where the characters, the 3D rigs, are treated as if they're actually 2D, and that's where a lot of the visual humor comes in and actually really succeeds. It's got really punchy timing, and parts, for example, where they would have the character turn to a flat profile view that's very 2D in nature. That's not something that's generally done in 3D because 3D usually fully utilizes the three-dimensionality of the characters and the cameras and environments, so they wouldn't have a flat profile view of a character like this. You'd be able to see like the inside of the cheek on the other side of the mouth, the teeth, a bit of the other eye, and so on, because that's how the 3D world usually works. But having these moments where the characters are treated as flat 2D characters, and we have this really 2D looking, exaggerated silhouette with the mouth wide open, gives it a really fun comedic feel. I was actually really strongly reminded of the 3D Peanuts movie, you know, Snoopy, Charlie Brown, and that whole gang, while I was watching The Bad Guys, because they treated the rigs and the setup of the rigs and a lot of the treatment in a very similar way. In Peanuts, they also had those moments where you'd have the profile of the character laughing or something with their mouth wide open, and that stark silhouette of their profile very flat, as well as the way they incorporated extra 2D expression lines and line work details at certain moments in the 3D rigs. In The Bad Guys, as well as in the Peanuts movie, They've got these 2D expression details, which makes for a really visually interesting treatment and gives an extra layer of interest and detail to those simplified 3D characters. And it makes them feel like they're actually straight out of a comic book. So while it's not a new treatment, because a similar effect was achieved in 2015 with the Peanuts movie, it's not something that's commonly used in 3D animation. So it still feels like a new and novel effect. And I really loved it. It worked really, really well. They did push it a little further here in The Bad Guys. And in some shots, it really helps to make it feel like a graphic novel in motion, which makes sense, of course, because The Bad Guys is based on a graphic novel series. So when a character smiled really big or snarled or raised their eyebrows or did something really expressive, there were these flat 2D line details that were part of the rigs that the animators could manipulate and have appear or disappear whenever they needed to. Here, they took that graphic novel look even further with these solid black outlines and even these motion lines in the background. You can see that the shading and the fur and stuff has been treated in a way that it's really simplified, right down to the basics and basic shapes. So those extra graphical details over that kind of gives it a little extra punch of interest and texture. If they'd had these extra expression lines over very detailed fur, like, you know, fur where you could see every strand with all these variations in the colors and other little details like pores on the noses and stuff like that, then these extra expression details would have been completely lost and had no impact. But the way they did it gives it a really cool effect. They do also have some textural variation and detail baked into the textures that's always there permanently because it's baked in, like these lines on the wolf snout, just to give it all a little bit extra depth so it's not completely flat. It does have these textural details, which makes it feel very hand painted. There are also times when they manipulate certain body parts to give it a more stylized graphical 2D feel and also to make the characters feel more human because while they are animals, they're dangerous animals and people, you know, a lot of people are scared of these types of animals. So they want to make them feel more human so we can empathize with them better. So like when the snake is talking here, if you watch his mouth, it switches between a full set of teeth to him having fangs and back to a full set of teeth, which really humanizes him. Or at times with the spider, she actually has less legs to make her more appealing since a lot of people hate spiders and all their creepy little legs. And it keeps the shot simple and not too cluttered with all the legs she has. It really helps to support that stylized effect and make the animals less intimidating for us as the audience. They used physically based lighting just like with any 3D scene, but some components also seem to be independently lit or illuminated, like their eyes, which are almost treated as 2D and flat. 
They're not affected by the physical lighting the way everything else is. They're slightly affected at some times where you can see that 3D volume on the eyeball, but at other times, the eyes seem totally 2D and self-illuminated, especially in darker scenes or when other parts of the face are in shadow. They're really distinctive and they stand out in pretty much every scene. They even have these thick outlines around them to make sure they really take front and center and we get the most emotion and expressiveness out of them. Something else that's really interesting in the progression of the film is the transition of the color palette as it shifts with the characters from bad guys to good guys. So when they're the bad guys with bad intentions, they're portrayed in a very warm palette with really yellowish lighting, which brings a lot of energy and intensity. And in some ways, because it's such a saturated yellow, it's an element of surrealism and maybe even aggression because these guys have ill intentions. They're bad guys. In the beginning, it reminds me a lot of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And what initially made me think of that was the outfit that the snake is wearing. And I'm not sure if it's supposed to be a nod to that, but the color palette in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is often very warm too. And of course, you know, because that was based in LA and this is based in LA or at least a similar city in a desert, of course, it makes sense that the lighting would be really warm and yellowish. But as the film progresses, it becomes much cooler and in some parts quite blue. Even in parts where they're outside, the lighting is pretty blue as opposed to when the film starts and they're being bad and the daylight is so yellow. Look at how warm this coloring is with them all in the car at the beginning of the film and then here at the end. There's a big difference in the warmth of the tones and lighting. It's a nice subtle way to signify that shift and growth in the characters. I really like how they put a lot of care into designing the characters as these anthropomorphized animals. Like the tarantula isn't just this leggy, spiky, creepy spider. They really considered how to make her cute and endearing. She doesn't just have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen like your typical tarantula. She's got a neck and a head, and that separation gives her a more distinctive and clean silhouette, and it makes her much more human and appealing. With the snake, they also used and animated his body so cleverly that you forgot he didn't have limbs. Like, there's obviously the standard use of holding things in his tail like they always do when they animate a sentient snake, but they had these angles in his body that separated it into the typical joints or segments you'd have with a body, a neck, and a head. And when he uses his tail as a hand, it has joints in it like an arm and a hand with a wrist and a finger. Like in this scene here where the wolf is trying to convince them to go good, or at least pretend to, you've got the two strong skeptics here with the spider and the snake. And spider has arms that she can fold, but snake has his body knotted in a way and at the same position as arms would be, so it looks as if he also has his arms crossed. Or here where he's lying in bed and his tail is looped up and curled around the top of the blanket just like a hand. They were really smart with how they utilized the limitations they had here with him and his lack of limbs. A lot of the animation was done on twos, threes, and even in some parts it was done on fours, which gives it a really snappy and choppy animation feel. This scene here was so cool. When the Crimson Paw breaks into the prison to break the bad guys out, it's so fast and slick, it's got a real vibe, and some really well-timed visual humor. It shows how you can make a fight scene epic, but also comedic. And incidentally, the timing and spacing in the shot that I'm going to talk about now is pretty damn fantastic. And my last video was actually about timing and spacing. So if you're an animator and you're interested in improving your timing and spacing, maybe you should check out that video as well. So in this scene, they used a lot of cool 2D sprite effects overlaid here with motion blur and a lot of smear frames and speed lines. I also love the atmosphere with the flat volumetric lighting streaming down from above and the dust particles in the air. It's almost like the scene is happening on a stage with the main action spotlit and the outer areas are like the wings of the stage in shadow while the next person waits for their cue or gets hit back into the wings when their turn is done. Because there's a lot of back and forth with guards attacking and getting thrown out of the scene. So that lighting and staging ensures that we don't get distracted by what's happening on the periphery and we're always drawn to the focal point. There's the Crimson Paw running forward here and you can see there's this really stark edge lighting that gives it a very graphic comic book feel. It also serves the purpose of having the characters all much more defined, which helps with clarity in the shot because it's all happening so fast that it can be easy to lose detail and definition and things can get muddy and confusing quite easily with all this fast action and the interaction between characters being so close to each other while they fight. It gives you some separation so we can still clearly see who is who and what their actions are. It's also quite a lot less saturated than other scenes which also makes it feel more edgy and high stakes. They're using a handheld camera effect here to match that kinetic, always moving energy of the fight as the camera follows the Crimson Paw around the shot as she fucks shit up. We're starting off here from quite a low angled shot, 
near to the floor since a lot of her moves right now are close to the floor. And we can see she's got the upper hand here. If it was a high angled shot, we would have gotten the effect that she was less in power and more vulnerable. So she's running forwards towards this guard and we've got the smear frames and 2D speed lines here on her arm as she accelerates into the move and launches off her right foot, jumping into the air and turning. And again, we've got those speed lines and we see her eyes are quite bright in that hood because everything else is in shadow around her face, but we see her eyes kind of self-illuminated. So we can also see the anticipation as her body's turned away, but her eyes look towards where she's going. She has some hang time in the air, which is some nice spacing contrast there from the fast into the movement, and then the hang before the turn completes, and she accelerates again into the next move, which is to land on her knee and hands with one leg sweeping out and around to knock the guard's legs out from under her. There's a really nice arc there with her leg, which is further emphasized by that smear frame. Nice silhouettes there with the guard's fingers out like that and the crimson paws fingers tented and her elbows squarely out like that. Good negative space and separation between the two characters even though they're overlapping each other, they're both still clearly defined. The timing is so smooth as her leg comes around to take her weight. And you see that adjustment there in her ankle and foot as her weight moves from her hands onto that foot as she has a bit of a moving hold there, waiting to see the impact of her move on the guard and regaining her balance, as well as to vary the spacing and give us a bit of time to catch up with what's happening. If it was just a constant barrage of fast moves, we'd lose interest in the scene and not get that clarity we're afforded in the momentary lulls in the action as our brains catch up. The guard falls backwards and we've got a nice clear silhouette there with the guard's legs up and fingers all haywire. It's kind of a higgledy-piggledy silhouette, if you get what I'm saying, to show she's been thrown off. It's not all smooth lines and elegant limbs. She's got no control and was caught totally off guard. And you can see that too with her eyes and mouth so big and open. The crimson paw does this sort of scuttle forward and a really cool rolling move, then pushes up with her hands. Again, a lot of smear frames and motion lines, and she flips up into this guard's arms, and he is totally shook. Got a bit of a squash and stretch on his head there as he stops when he catches her, and she cheekily raises a finger to his lips. His eyes are still staring straight ahead in shock because they need time to catch up, and then they dart down to her in one frame. And for a while there, again, a moving hold to let us get the joke. All that's moving is the camera and the cloth of his pant legs and her hood settling. There's an anticipatory movement as she tenses her body so we know she's about to do something and then her leg comes up really fast and smashes into the side of his face. And we have that 2D impact, comic book graphic and an extreme amount of exaggeration there as his head completely deforms and then settles into something that's still really exaggerated but it fits in well with the comedy of the scene. And then he stands dead still while she flits all around him like some kind of fox fairy of death because she's moving too fast for him to react yet and he's still stunned from getting kneed in the head. She grabs him by the collar and we see there's some follow through on his head there and the counteraction of his arms then going up as his head and shoulders go down. She grabs him and throws him over her and he hurdles toward the camera and the camera follows him and it's a nice smooth cut to the shark, piranha and tarantula just sitting there watching like WTF as he gets thrown past them and the camera maintains that nice sideways motion in the same direction so the cut feels natural. And again there's a nice comedic touch to get their reaction there with all this action going on around them and they're just standing there with wide open eyes in the eye of the storm. They're framed centrally so they're the focus of this shot, quite colorful against the gray of everything else and their expressions are everything. I love the piranha's face here with his lips all pursed like that, like he's kind of loving the drama but also he wants to keep a low profile. And the guard who just got thrown there hangs a few frames with just his legs sticking into the frame and the eyes of the three are in his direction and as he starts to slide down we've got the next victim I mean the guard coming in and these guys eyes slide to her direction as she runs past which gives us some anticipation as well for what comes next so she's coming in from off screen and she comes in fast slows a bit there as she rounds the corner so we can register that she's there and anticipate the next part of the fight as she attacks and it's such gold as the camera doesn't even bother to follow her it just moves to the side to accommodate and anticipate what happens next and frame these guys with the rule of thirds so we can still see their reaction as she's thrown back into the frame just a few seconds later also extremely exaggerated for comedic effect and she hangs there in the air for a few frames then drops really heavily and we hold on these guys to get their expression and give some breathing space before the next high energy shot. When we cut back to the crimson paw, the camera is now in a two shot level with her face. So it's not low or high angled and it's tighter on her and her opponent so we can see her fast handwork and his expression. She kicks him into the other guard off screen and the Dutch angle of the camera gives us an off kilter, unbalanced feel. Like the two guards would be feeling everything's off balance. We cut away again, now to Mr. Wolf and Snake and the guards holding them. And again, it's a little break from all the frenetic craziness of the fight 
a good way to keep people interested with a break in the pace. And the two guards holding them are frozen and all the focus is on Snake and Wolf just watching in disbelief. And then that quick little side eye to each other and then back to the fight again. It's a really simple shot, but it works very well for a moment of stillness in all the action. I really like how they've got her toying with the guard here. There's a great contrast here with the line of her leg and the bent leg that a weight is on. And this arm out straight here to give her balance and the little impact sprite here. Very cool perspective and staging with the guard's arm right in the foreground and the lines of his body guiding our eyes. She kicks the baton away and does this neat leap into the air, tricks him into thinking she's going to attack from above, but then as she lands, and whoa, I really thought she was going for something else there for a second, but no, she's grabbing his belt. Again, a little comedic break in pace as his pants fall down and she's got this really strong pose with great contrast in the lines. One arm straight with the belt falling down, extending the line, one arm bent, hips and shoulders tilted for a more dynamic pose. It has so much attitude and confidence. He freaks out and she does this beautiful little jump and amazing footwork as she spins in the air. Arms so nonchalantly held behind her, so cocky and rightfully so, as she plants one foot on the ground and uses the other to kick him. And again, a really strong, beautiful pose and silhouette to end that on. I was bothered that there was no explanation for why some animals were sentient and so anthropomorphized while others were just your average dumb animals. And it wasn't a case of like herbivores were dumb and predators were sentient and anthropomorphized. There was a mixture of both and there was no explanation for why. Like you've got one really smart guinea pig and then you've got this whole bunch of really dumb lab animal guinea pigs that don't know anything about anything. They're just normal guinea pigs. I know it's fantastical. I know it's not real. So you don't need to tell me that in the comments. Maybe it's just my dumb adult brain unwilling to suspend disbelief that far. But I feel like it might have given the film a little bit more depth to have a bit of explanation about the structure of society, especially because the movie was based on the fact that these predators were treated as if they were bad guys before they'd even proven they were bad guys. So then they became bad guys. You know, if the whole premise of your film is sort of built on that, maybe there needs to be a bit more of an explanation about why that is. And where are all the other predators? Is everything segregated? Are they usually predator cities where the predators live and they can live without being judged by humans? I don't know, man. You never told me. And it was bugging me while I was watching the movie. But apart from that, it's a small concern, but I do wish there was a little bit more backstory and structure to it. How does society function like that? Why do we have some animals that are sentient and some that are not? Why are they integrated with the humans if the humans are treating them like shit? Are there other cities that they could have possibly lived in? I don't know, man. I wish I did know, but I don't. So I don't know. My issues with it are very minimal, obviously. It was just that one little thing that sort of bothered me about it. But I felt like if I'm doing a review video on this, I need to be honest and bring up the things that did sort of bother me because otherwise it's not a true review. I would definitely recommend the movie to people though. On the whole, it was a fantastic movie. Loved the treatment, loved the animation, loved the graphics and I'm definitely gonna watch it again. Thank you to my beautiful Shining patrons over on Patreon. You guys are the bomb diggity. In case you others didn't know, I do have a Patreon page where I share works in progress, useful resources that I find online or make myself. And for some of my tiers, I do a monthly feedback critique on animated shots that they submit. So if you wanna go and check that out, support the channel, go ahead. It's on my Patreon, link is in the description. Please give the video a like if you did like it. If you got this far, I'm gonna assume that you did. It really helps with the algorithm. And let me know in the comments what you guys thought about the bad guys if you did watch it and if you guys had any issues with it. Maybe think about subscribing if you haven't yet to keep up with my videos. I upload usually bi-weekly, sometimes weekly if my schedule permits it, but you know, it is what it is. Thanks for watching guys. Love ya. Bye.